Welcome to the Federalist Society's webinar call. Today, February 10th, we discuss foreign sovereign and international organization immunity in US courts, recent developments in the way forward. My name is Guy DeSantis, and I'm Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Today, we are fortunate to have with us our moderator, Harut Samra, Counsel DLA Piper. Throughout the panel, if you have any questions, please submit them through the question and answer feature or the chat so that our speakers will have access to them for when we get to that portion of the webinar. With that, thank you for being with us today. Harut, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, Guy, and thank you to the Federalist Society as well as to the International National Security Practice Group uh, for sponsoring today's event. As Guy mentioned a moment ago, the title of today's program is Foreign Sovereign and International Organization Immunity in U.S. Courts. And the real purpose of today's program is to give everyone a sense of recent developments in this area, which have been the subject of Supreme Court precedents recently, uh, but also to, to try to anticipate where we're going in this area. Uh, as many of you know, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act and the International Organizations Immunities Act, which was enacted in 1945, codify the immunities afforded to foreign states and certain specified or enumerated international organizations in the U.S. courts. Uh, sovereign and international organization immunity stands really at the nexus of international affairs, policy, and the law, topics I think we're going to be discussing over the course of the day as we kind of work through this subject. Uh, today, we'll concentrate on recent developments, as I said, in this dynamic area. It's changing and it's evolving, and I think there's some exciting developments that we're going to be discussing over the course of the hour, but particularly in light of the recent Supreme Court case, JAM versus IFC, which is a pending case and uh, one of whose litigants we have with us today to discuss the program. So I'll introduce our two speakers who are really, I think, perfectly suited uh, for this subject. The first is Rick Hertz. Rick directs Earthrights International's work on cases against multinational corporations and international organizations for international human rights and environmental abuses in federal and state courts. He's been litigating these issues for over 25 years and has filed amicus briefs in the U.S. Supreme Court and various U.S. circuit and district courts on behalf of NGOs, law professors, and others in important human rights cases. He advises human rights and environmental activists and lawyers on international law and is co-counsel, as I mentioned, for the plaintiffs in JAM versus IFC and DOE versus IFC. Elliot Pedrosa is a partner with the law firm Jones Day. He's a first chair litigator and a trial lawyer with over 20 years of experience representing businesses in complex and challenging litigation involving frequently international disputes as well as other disputes, including financial securities and products liability. He recently completed a term as the Senate confirmed executive director, uh, rather a director of the Inter-American Development Bank and that's, which is, of course, the largest source of development finance for Latin America and the Caribbean. So with that, I'd like to ask Elliot, Elliot, if you can maybe give us a little bit of the framework. Let's discuss the FSIA, the organizational, uh, International Organizational Immunities Act, and some of the other sources of law in this area. Happy to, Harut. Thanks for the invitation, and thanks uh, to Guy and to the Federalist Society and to the practice group for putting together this program. Um, uh, you, you sort of... You sort of laid down the tablecloth. Let me let me sort of lay out the place settings a little bit so that we sort of understand where we are. And to do that, I want to take us back to 1944. Uh, World War II is still raging, but the end is in sight. And the U.S. and its allies are starting to eye what the post-war world is going to look like. They're reflecting on the utter failure of the League of Nations to prevent a second global outbreak of war within a 30 year stretch. And they're trying to craft the architecture of an international system that can do a better job of avoiding massive global conflicts like World War I and World War II. In the US and the UK, some policymakers are also very nervously eyeing Stalin and the Soviet Union and uh, the threat from the international spread of conflict. So in 1944, representatives from 44 countries get together in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, to iron out a framework for two international financial institutions. Those would later become the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, the IMF would help stabilize the international monetary system. The World Bank would promote development by making loans uh, to help with reconstruction after the war and to help poorer countries develop. And then a year later, 
uh, 45 countries signed the UN Charter, and then there's just an explosion of a, an international alphabet soup of organizations. Now, at this time, the US is, is an emerging superpower, really the only emerging superpower because the Soviet Union is still pretty far behind. The US has proven twice that it has an economic and industrial capacity that for all intents and purposes is limitless. And unlike the rest of the world, the US's infrastructure is largely untouched by the war. So at the end of World War I, President Wilson had been the chief proponent of the League of Nations. Senate never ratified it. And that's one of the big reasons that it became utterly useless. And so there's a recognition both inside the United States and around the world that if the US is not going to be uh, an important player in any international organizations that are created in the aftermath of World War II, they're sort of going to be doomed to the same fate. So everyone wants the US to be heavily involved. And one of the reasons that they want to do that is by setting the headquarters of a number of these organizations, including the Bretton Woods organizations, including the United Nations, in the United States. So in 1945, anticipating this, Congress enacts the International Organizations Immunities Act, which creates a legal framework for the US um, to, to recognize international organizations so that it can be a host and define their privileges and immunities from local law. And with, respects to law, with respect to lawsuits and legal, pra, um, legal process, what the act says is that international organizations will have, quote, the same immunities from suit and every form of judicial process as is enjoyed by foreign governments, end quote. Now, in 1945, there is no act of Congress that defines what the immunities enjoyed by foreign sovereigns are. Instead, courts look to the State Department basically to decide as a matter of policy, not law, what uh, immunity is in any given case. And in 1945, the State Department's view is consistent with what's known as the classical theory of foreign sovereign immunity, which for all intents and purposes is essentially absolute immunity from suit for foreign sovereigns. That's 1945 when the International Organization Immunities Act is passed. In 1952, it's President Truman's last year in office, and the State Department decides to reverse its position and adopt what's known as the restrictive theory of sovereign immunity, which basically divides sovereign acts into two categories. Um, truly sovereign acts, which are things that governments do, and then commercial acts, which are things which are defined as things that commercial actors can also do. And the State Department's restrictive theory is that foreign sovereigns are immune from suit for sovereign acts, but not for commercial acts. And they put out a letter that explains that the reasoning behind this shift is that foreign governments are, are, are starting to participate as commercial actors issuing, issuing debt on public markets and, and engaging in a series of commercial activities, which really requires that private counterparties to contracts have an ability to enforce the rights and obligations that are created by contract. So that's 1952. It takes Congress uh, a couple of decades, but they actually get involved in 1976 Post Watergate, they're passing act after act, really stripping the executive branch and the president of power. And one of the things that they pass is the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, which probably everyone on this call is familiar with, which as you mentioned, Harut, codifies the, the immunities and codifies the restrictive theory of sovereign immunity. So it creates sort of a presumption of immunity for foreign sovereigns, but then it enumerates a series of exceptions, the most I would argue the most important of which is the commercial activity exception, which I think we'll talk about in the context of the Champ case. So it's 1976, and now you have these two statutes. You have the, the FSIA, which defines now by statute what are the immunities of foreign sovereigns in the United States. And you have the 1945 International Organization Immunities Act, which now together create at least an arguable ambiguity because the IOIA says that the international organizations have the same immunity, quote, as is enjoyed by foreign sovereigns. Well, does that mean as was enjoyed by foreign sovereigns in 1945 when the International Organization Immunities Act was passed? Or does that mean that 
the law of international organization immunity evolves in parallel with changes in the law of foreign sovereign immunity. And does that mean that in 1952, when the State Department adopted the restrictive theory, that applied to international organizations? And then in 1976, when Congress adopts the FSIA, does that now apply to international organizations? And, and that was the question really presented to the US Supreme Court, and before that, the DC Circuit and DC District in the JAM case, which, which both Rick and I will talk a little bit more about later. Just before we get to that, there's a third layer that is possibly equally important, and in some cases, really the trump card. Um, and that is that each of the international organizations exists by charter, and those charters are treaties. And so in the US, provided that the charter was signed by the president and ratified by two thirds of the Senate, the charter itself has the force of federal law. And every international organization charter that I've ever seen has a section on privileges and immunities. Some of them are sort of general and don't really define them all that well. Others of them are very specific and very broad. Some of them are self-executing, some of them maybe not. And so it's really an organization by organization analysis. But for example, the JAM case discusses how broad the IMF's charter immunity is. The IMF has what I think the Supreme Court characterized, and I would agree, is, is an absolute immunity um, theory incorporated into its charter in language that certainly appears to be self-executing. And so to the extent that we have a debate uh, or, or that courts have a debate um, uh, about what the International Organization Immunities Act might mean, it's largely not all that relevant for the IMF because the IMF has its own charter, which has its own very broad uh, statement of immunity. So with that, I think the table's a little bit set and uh, I'll hand it back to you, Herb. Yeah, we're ready. We're ready to jump in for the meal now. And so, uh, Rick, I, I really want to turn it over to you. We, we've gotten this really robust overview of the statutory dynamics and some of the context that led to it. Uh, can you tell us a little bit before we get to JAM versus IFC, which Elliot sort of previewed a little bit, how has this developed, you know, in the 70 years or so of, of cases and history that have, you know, ensued since the end of the Second World War. Sure, but first, thank you to the, to the Federal Society for inviting me here today. Um, I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, uh, Elliot's really laid out, uh, I think, the structure, and I'll just be putting a little bit of, of to, to extend his metaphor, a little bit of meat on the bone of what he said. Um, so th there, there are two ways to get uh, to sue an international organization, either through their waiver provisions and their own charters or through through statute and statutory sort of waivers of immunity or exceptions to immunity. The first, as Elliot said, is the IOIA, which entitles the IFC only to the same immunity from suit as is enjoyed by foreign governments. Now, most of the so let me just back up a quick second. Almost all of the jurisprudence on both of these issues comes from the DC circuit. And that's because DC is where these organizations for the most part are headquartered. Uh, so, so it's almost, so, so the leading cases are up in the DC circuit. And the first one I'd just like to mention is, is Atkinson where the DC circuit said that the phrase in the IOIA as is enjoyed means that international organizations get the same immunity foreign governments get in 1945 when the IOIA was passed, not the immunity that foreign governments get today. And then they went further and said that when the IOIA was passed, foreign sovereign immunity was automatically absolute. Now, uh, as suggested, that, that raises two questions. Do they really get should they really get the immunity of 1945? And what was the immunity in 1945? So um, the DC circuit had applied this rule of absolute immunity a number of times. Um, and then we got, uh, we filed our case in JAM, which was a case uh, against the IFC for its involvement in a coal fired power plant in India that devastated the li livelihoods of local farmers and fishermen. And we said, look, both of, Atkinson's conclusions are wrong. First, as enjoyed, but as enjoyed, the, the term as enjoyed in the IOA has to refer to immunity today, not immunity in 1945. 
But even if you were going to say that uh, you look to 1945, um, immunity wasn't actually absolute. It was whatever the State Department said. Now, to be sure, they usually said immunity is absolute, but not always. And if you're going to apply a rule of immunity is whatever the State Department says, you wouldn't look to what the State Department said about immunity in 1945, because the whole point of deferring to an immunity rule is to get the state, uh, deferring to the State Department to get the State Department's uh, rule today. So under either, or, or uh, policy today. So under either of those approaches, you're going to get to the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Um, because that's what the State Department has said should apply today. Now, this case went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court looked as a pure textual matter and said, as is enjoyed, looks to immunity today. And therefore, the IOIA essentially incorporates the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. The second way to get to, uh, to, uh, to sue an international organization is through its waiver provisions. Now, the waiver provision of, of some organizations, in particular the IFC and other, uh, other entities in the World Bank Group, uh, is very broad. It says actions may be brought against the corporation. The first time the DC Circuit looked at this about 50 years ago, they said, they just read the plain language and said, that means you can be sued. But subsequent, and that was in a case called Lutcher. Subsequently, in a case called Mandaro, the DC circuit created a new test and said, well, there has to be a corresponding benefit. We, we don't think what the DC circuit says, we don't think they really meant the language to be as broad as they wrote it. Uh, and that they wouldn't have waived immunity, we think, unless they got a benefit for waiving immunity. And therefore international organizations are immune unless they can show the organization would benefit from the type of suit at issue. Um, the DC circuit, like most circuits or perhaps all circuits is not supposed to, one panel was not supposed to rewrite the jurisprudence of another panel, but they did. And Mindoro has been the rule that has been followed consistently by the DC circuit ever since, um, including in the JAM case. So I, I think that kind of brings us up to speed on where uh, the, uh, the state of the law is now. Uh, at least in general terms. And we'll talk about uh, in a bit about where these issues uh, play out going forward. But I think now I'll turn it back over to Yeah, her. no, thank you, Rick, for that sort of overview. And so, Elliot, I wanted to turn back to you. And having had the perspective of, you know, working with one of the institutions as the U.S. Executive Director to the IDB, I know one of the things that's relevant here that as part of this continued table setting is the sort of structure of many of these institutions. And you touched on this earlier. Uh, can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit before we jump into the JAM case? Sure, so uh, as you mentioned, I did, I did work as executive director uh, at the IDB. The IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, is, um, was founded in 1960 and really modeled after the World Bank, but intended to be regional in character. And it was the first regional bank that was established. Um, there were thereafter a number of other regional banks established. The United States is a member of four different regional banks, um, the African Development Bank, Asian, uh, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and the IDB. But there are probably a dozen others of which the U.S. is not a member. Um, and the, the five that the U.S. is a member of are all patterned, the four that the U.S. is a member of are patterned after the World Bank Group's structure. And that structure is that the highest decision-making um, body of the organization is a board of governors that is comprised primarily of finance ministers. Some countries, it's not the finance minister, it's a different um, a cabinet level minister, but usually it's the finance minister of the member countries. For the US, that means the treasury secretary serves as the US governor uh, in the highest policy-making body of the institution. So, uh, Currently, Secretary Yellen is also governor, U.S. governor of the World Bank. As you can imagine, the finance ministers have lots of other duties and they, they can't be running uh, the international financial institutions on a day-to-day -day basis. So most of the day-to-day -day decision making and the day-to-day -day policy making is delegated to a board of executive directors who are uh, appointed by each member country. In the case of the United States, that's the job that I had at the IDB. 
and obviously I had counterparts at the World Bank Group uh, while I was while I was at IDB, but I never worked at the World Bank Group. Um, the other part of the structure that I think is Im important to understand, and so these are inherently political animals. They are political animals um, that are led by bodies on which representatives of uh, foreign sovereigns um, make policy by voting. Um, the other important thing to understand is that each of these institutions, with the exception of the European Bank, have both a public sector lending window where they lend to governments, sometimes just to help them um, make up their, what we call budget support, to help them make up their public budgets, but also to finance particular projects, a dam, a power plant, a road, a bridge. Um, and at the World Bank, that's done through three entities, the IBRD, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, IDA, IDA, the International Development Agency, and uh, MIGA, which is a multilateral investment guarantee, uh, I think it's association. And all three of those lend to governments. But the World Bank has another entity called the IFC, which is the entity that was the defendant in the JAM case, whose mission is different. It is to lend into the private sector. Now, it still works in coordination with the host government of its where its borrowers are located. And the voting on the IFC is exactly like the voting at the IBRD and the other public sector windows. That means it is controlled by uh, political appointees of member governments who own the shares in the institution. But instead of lending money to, for example, Bolivia to build a road, it will lend money to a private corporation or potentially a public-private partnership uh, to build a road or, or engage in whatever other project. And so the JAM case arises in the context of a power plant, a coal-fired power plant built in India that was financed in part by a loan from the IFC. That loan would have been approved in Washington by the board of executive directors of the IFC, which is made up largely of the exact same people that are on the board of executive directors of the other World Bank uh, entities. But the actual construction of the dam, uh, excuse me, of the power plant happened in India and the supervision of that construction happened through the local office in India. And all of this becomes important on remand after the Supreme Court opinion when the court is tasked with determining whether or not the, the actions of the World Bank upon which the plaintiffs were suing fall under the commercial activity exception um, of the, the FSIA incorporated into the IOIA. So with that, I'm probably already starting to tread onto the next section and I'll stop again and hand it back to yeah, thank you, Elliot. And so actually that dovetails well. And so what, what we wanna do now is having kind of given this background talking about the different institutions that are in play, the, the, the statutory framework and the evolution of sort of the case law over the last now 80 almost years. Rick, tell us a little bit, you know, expand on sort of the introduction that, that Elliot's given on sort of JAM versus IFC. Give us a little bit of background about the case and its procedural history has sort of been interesting if you want to give us an overview of that. Uh, and then we can talk a little bit about broadly where things stand now. Uh, sure. So, um... You know, as we've said a little bit, JAM versus IFC is a case uh, against the IFC for funding a uh, coal-fired power plant in India. Um, the power plant itself made no economic sense and makes no economic sense. It's completely uh, losing money because it was dependent on low-priced coal from Indonesia that didn't materialize. But that apart, it's caused enormous uh, environmental and social damage to its neighbors. Uh, in the communities around the plant by des destroying the fisheries. Uh, uh, it, it's, it didn't line its intake channel, so salt waters in, uh, intruded into the groundwater, um, making it unusable for drinking and farming. And there's been you know, um, obvious uh, air pollution impacts on uh, local people. So we went we, we sued the IFC in DC. We went all the way to the Supreme Court on the question of whether IFC uh, can be sued at all or whether it's uh, absolutely immune. 
The Supreme Court, as we've discussed, said that it's that its immunity must be determined under under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. So we were remanded back to the district court to sit, to 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 litigate the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. And this is where, in one sense, this case becomes vastly more important than it used to be, because now it's a Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act case um, that applies you know, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act just as much to international organizations as to um, foreign governments. So we said, uh, so the, the, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act says there's no immunity if a claim is based upon the foreign sovereign's com commercial activity in the United States. And we said, as Elliot alluded to, everything IFC did was, was in the United States. It approved the loan in the United States. It approved the design of the plant in the United States. That's where IFC made all of its decisions. Um, and it's commercial activity because they were loaning money to uh, a private party to build a private project at market-based uh, interest rates, which a private party, you know, they were just acting like a bank. So in our view, that meant, that met the commercial activities exception of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. IFC argued and the DC circuit held that because the harm uh, to our clients was most directly caused by the power plant owner, uh, the claim wasn't quote, based upon IFC's conduct at all. It was based upon the third party's conduct. And now that uh, is a sea change in the law. The, the law has always looked to across many different circuits the foreign state's own conduct, not the conduct of third parties to determine what, what the claim is based upon. Because if you're gonna determine uh, whether a foreign state entity or an international uh, organization is immune for particular conduct, that makes the most sense. You, apply, you say, well, is the conduct commercial activity in the United States? The DC circuit didn't do that. Um, and it's now at odds with a number of other circuits in, in being the first circuit to look uh, to the act of another party and to create this vague and undefined test of what's the most direct cause of the harm. Now, the, the biggest loser, I think, in, in this, this, uh, this change in the law is, US, is the U.S. business community and U.S. investors, because there's all sorts of cases where U.S. Uh, businesses get into commercial disputes uh, with a number of parties, another, a number of potentially liable parties, one of which is a foreign government entity, uh, but the foreign government entity isn't necessarily the most direct cause of the harm. For example, there's cases where uh, they've sued uh, foreign government entities for abetting fraud. Or for example, there's a case that ExxonMobil brought against a Cuban government entity for trafficking in uh, property that was um, expropriated by the Cuban government. Um, and, and the argument is that, well, the argument under the DC Circuit's opinion would be, well, look, uh, what actually injured Exxon was not the trafficking uh, in the expropriated property by uh, this government entity, it was the actual seizure of the property by, by the government itself. And so under that theory, uh, the government entity should be immune. Um, a third example is there's uh, uh, litigation uh, against a, a Chinese sovereign enterprise and a number of other sovereign entities and ordinary commercial entities for conspiracy to, to fix television part prices. Um, the conspiracy itself allegedly uh, cost American businesses billions of dollars. And you know, one of the, some of the entities were sovereign entities involved in the conspiracy. Under the DC Circuit's approach, um, you couldn't sue the sovereign entities at all because they weren't the most direct cause of the harm. So this is a, a, an important uh, issue, important to a lot in a lot of different contexts to a lot of different parties. And um, because there's a circuit split, we have just recently filed a cert petition. Uh, the IFC has not uh, yet responded to the cert petition. Their brief, I think, is due in the middle of March. Um, and so we'll see if, this, if the Supreme Court allows this circuit split to stand or steps in. Uh, thank that, you for that. Back. Yeah, thank you for that, Rick. And, and we're going to go a little bit into where do we go from here uh, in a little bit as well. I, I, I do want to mention we've, we've had a question come in 
I will um, be looking at the questions and we've reserved time at the end, but if there's a particularly timely question, uh, feel free to submit it and I'll go ahead and raise it during the course of the presentation uh, of our two speakers. So, uh, but continue to submit questions. We have reserved time uh, at, the, at the end of today's program to address any additional questions that you all submit. So thank you for that. So as we discuss sort of where we go from here and Rick, you've sort of laid, that, laid out how I think there is really the possibility for significant change more broadly even than with regard to international organization immunity, but frankly, with regard to the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Um, if, we want, if we pull back just for a moment to some of the policy issues around sort of an international organization sort of operation here in the US, some of the uh, things that arise from their perspective. Elliot, having served uh, in the roles that you served in at the IDB, you know, can you walk us through some of the perspectives from the international organization standpoint as to these issues? Sure. Um, I, I think I'll mention three things. And the first is sort of to take just a, a step back from it and not so much talk about the policy considerations of, of how you define the immunity, but rather think about what kinds of entities these are. Um, we're, we're probably all lawyers on this call. And one of my favorite expressions is when, when all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Harut, I think I've actually used that in another panel that you moderated. <laughs> um, but, it, but it absolutely rings true. And for lawyers, you know, we've got hammers in the law and that's what we're used to working with. And so it's very easy to see an entity and it looks like a nail. But when you dig down into these entities, they're not nails. You know, they're, these are not they're 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 entirely different they are not commercial banks um, they are not commercial corporations they are really bodies through which sovereign policy making is channeled and incentivized with money and so the boards of these institutions are inherently political boards where there is horse trading there is persuasion and the US executes its foreign policy by how it wields its vote on these boards. Um, one thing that people should know is that with respect to the international financial institutions, including the World Bank Group, the IMF, the IDB, unlike the UN in which it's one country, one vote, at the IFES, the, the, the voting is weighted by shareholding and the US is the largest shareholder in each of these institutions. So at the World Bank Group, for example, the U.S.'s uh, vote is about 16%, and the next largest vote, uh, uh, the next largest weight by voting is China, which has about 5%. Most countries' vote is less than a percent. At the IDB, the U.S., I had a 30% share, so my vote counted for 30%. The next largest was 11%. And so these are tools of US foreign policy and tools of the foreign policy of all of the other member institutions. And they are really political bodies. Um, second point that I'll make, each of these institutions has an internal, what they call an internal accountability mechanism, which is a way for the institution to monitor and police itself audit its own projects to determine whether they're complying with its own rules and regulations and whether they're having the effectiveness that they really want to have in terms of spurring local development and provide a mechanism for a, 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 a something that you can think of like an alternative dispute resolution process. So they are really by charter created to be self-contained in that respect. And so the idea that there needs to be immunity is sort of in order for them to achieve their political mission and maintain their inherently political character is counterbalanced by an internal mechanism that allows persons who feel that they've been aggrieved by some action of the institution to bring that to the attention of this internal body which has investigatory authority and for some of the banks has the authority to actually make decisions and either mediate a settlement in which compensation is paid or uh, even in some cases award compensation itself. And then the third thing that I'll talk about is that each of these institutions has a set of ESG policies, environmental, social, and governance policy, 
that they are required not only to adhere to themselves, but to ensure that the that the, the borrowers are adhering to, whether that borrower is a sovereign government or whether that borrower is a private sector entity or a government sponsored enterprise or a PPP, um, the banks by charter and by policy are required to make sure that their borrowers are following the best practices that are set at the banks. And those best practices are defined again by an entirely political process where the US and its European allies are often pushing in favor of very strict environmental, social, and governance safeguards to make sure that the banks are doing no harm and that the types of things that were alleged in the JAM case uh, don't happen. Are they perfect? I don't know of any human institution that is perfect, but they do have policies. And in fact, as I read the JAM case, uh, largely the claim was that IFC has what it calls its performance standards, which is its version of these ESG policies. And in this particular instance, there were ways in which they felt short. And there's actually an internal audit by one of the internal accountability mechanisms, you know, pointing out ways that the institution did not achieve all of the things that it would have liked to uh, have achieved in its uh, performance standards. And that's pretty typical across all of these international financial institutions that they have both those ESG policies that they require their borrowers to adhere to, and also an, internet, an internal accountability mechanism, which functions as like part inspector general and part ADR to allow for the resolution of certain disputes that might arise from the work of the institution. Got it. Thank you, Elliot. So, you know, I want to turn it over to Rick, having heard a little bit of sort of the policy uh, issues that really this these issues uh, implicate from the institutional perspective. Rick, do you want to maybe present the counterpoint to those and, and some of the policy issues that are implicated from the perspective of your clients? Sure. So, you know, I, I don't think any of those um, concerns uh, would in any real way speak against uh, suit or in favor of immunity. So the, the first one that the IFC acts as a political body, um, you know, that that may or may not be true, but the, the way that the uh, Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act has always been applied by the Supreme Court uh, and elsewhere is that you look at the character of the conduct to determine whether it's commercial, not the purpose of the conduct. And, you know, in this case, uh, when the IFC loans money, uh, it's loaning money uh, to a commercial entity to build a commercial product project uh, at market interest rates. And that is exactly what a commercial bank does. So it may have some other purpose in mind, but purpose is irrelevant to whether it's immune. Um, now, as to the internal watchdogs, that's also true that the IFC in particular has an organization called the CAO within it that's an internal uh, ombudsman. But the problem with that is that the IFC can, and in this case did, completely ignore its recommendations. So in this case, the CAO issued a scathing report that said that they had violated their own policies, that this project was a mess, and that they ought to do something about it. And the IFC said, thanks, but we're not going to do anything about it. Um, and, and one of the problems, one of the things that they said that they had violated was the third thing that Elliot spoke of, their own internal uh, environmental and social safeguards. Um, they, they said that they had ignored them and IFC basically did nothing about that either. Um, you know, the IFC exists to help poor people. That is its mission. And if, uh, according to it, it says that its intent to do no harm to people or the environment is quote, central to IFC's development mission. This is why, you know, even though there is this uh, in the DC circuit, there is this invented test that, um, you know, the, that the IFC has not waived its immunity uh, unless it benefits the organization. We, you know, we argued, uh, and I think we were right, that uh, this case, th these sorts of cases do benefit the IFC because the fundamental problem at, at IFC is that sometimes at least, too many people there are more interested in getting money out the door than actually rigorously serving uh, their poverty fighting mission. And that's essentially what the CAO identified as, as, as the issue. Um, and so when you have management that isn't serving IFC's development mission, at least in particular cases, the only way 
to actually enforce IFC's own mission is through, through cases like this one, which benefits the IFC. Um, and of course, you know, if IFC, as the Supreme Court said, uh, uh, if IFC feels, or if the political entities that run IFC, the government members, feel that they can't operate without li uh, with liability, they can just change their charter and immunize themselves. But they haven't done that. And, and, and that gets to their waiver point, which is they, when they formed, they understood uh, that they didn't need immunity. They granted a broad waiver. And now IFC is coming back and asking courts not to interpret the waiver the way it was written. Thank you, Rick. And so uh, we do have some questions coming in. I, I'm going to hold a couple of them to the end. But I think both of you have touched on the question that we received from John Crouch. So I wanted to put it to both of you now. Uh, Elliot, I think it's sort of a, a phrasing as a question, almost the point that you made. But I think if you want to elaborate on that a little bit, and then maybe Rick, if you want to respond to it. Uh, the question that John has presented to the panel is, if an international organization's purpose is basically commercial activity, such as international development, why should the commercial activity exception apply uh, well, to, to immunity apply. So, I mean, Elliot, if you want to maybe take that first, it's sort of a point that you had raised, um, elaborate on that a little bit. And then Rick, if you want to present a, a, your perspective on that as well. Sure. So if I'm understanding the, the, the question correctly, <clears throat> the, 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 the gist is um, if, if the organization's purpose is commercial, why isn't it commercial activity? Um, and and I, would, uh, I would quibble with the premise. Uh, the, the, now, Rick mentioned something which, which I'll concede, which is that the case law says that in applying the commercial activity exception, you don't look at the purpose, you look at the activity. And so if, if a country is acquiring tanks in order to be able to wage war, you don't look at, and, and you're dealing with an immunity challenge to an acquisition transaction, a contract to purchase tanks, you don't look at the fact that the reason that they're purchasing the tanks is to wage war, which is an inherent sovereign activity, you look at the activity itself. But putting that aside, I, I will quibble with the premise because the organization's purposes are not commercial at all. They're not to make money. They are to provide um, support in the form of lending where the market is not functioning and would not otherwise provide that lending. So. There are a number of people in the U.S. Uh, foreign policy community and at Treasury that question whether we still need these banks at all because there is so much private uh, uh, commercial finance available in the developing world. But the problem is that private commercial finance available in the developing world tends to go to the most well-financed private institutions. So the, you know, the five most wealthy families in Colombia have no problem getting a commercial loan to start a new business, but everyone else does. So you need an organization that can lend to banks with the condition that those banks lend out that money to small and medium-sized enterprises. That's one of the big things that um, IDB Invest, which is the IDB's version of IFC, would, would do. And all of it, is with a basic purpose in mind to uh, foster development in these countries to help the poor and to allow these countries to uh, create a better standard of living for these citizens. And I'll end sort of at the beginning with respect to the IDB and just a little bit of the germ of why the IDB was founded. The IDB is a, as an idea um, was first floated in the 19th century by a Brazilian president and nobody really cared much about it. It never got any traction. In 1959, there was a communist revolution in Cuba. And President Eisenhower said, well, this is a problem. This is on our doorstep. We need to figure out a way to provide an alternative to the developing countries in the world to communism by raising their standards of living. And they dug up this proposal for a development pact focused on Latin America and the Caribbean, and that became the IDB an inherently political purpose um, uh, uh, by the United States in, in cooperation with Brazil and, and other of the larger uh, regional economies to spur economic development in order to ward off the advance of international communism. And so actually, it, it, John just sent us a clarification. And if you wanna take one or two more minutes, Elliot, to explain, 
He says, I guess I phrased it wrong. If they're chartered to, uh, to pursue uh, their purposes by commercial means, how could Congress have intended their commercial activities would not be immune? Uh, you're on mute, Elliot. Because the commercial activity exception um, to the FSIA contains two very important words which are based upon. So in order for the commercial activity exception to apply, the claim has to be based upon commercial activity in the United States. Uh, and there, there are two other subsections, but that, that phrase based upon, and this is what the DC circuit focused on in its remand opinion in the JAM versus IFC case. If the claim, the, the commercial activity has to be in the United States and the claim has to be based upon that commercial activity in the United States. So if the claim is based upon commercial activity that occurs in India, that is not, that does not fall within the commercial activity exception to the FSIA. If the claim is not based on commercial activity at all, but is based on sovereign activity, that does not fall under the commercial activity exception to the FSIA. So there are lots of outs based on the text of the statute and the IFC court in that case determined that yes, there was commercial activity in the United States, but the claim wasn't based on it. The claim was based on activity in India, which was the way they constructed the power plant and the way that they administered it, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elliot. So Rick, same question um, with the clarification. Uh, I don't know if you'd like to, to, to elaborate on that point. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so th that is what the DC circuit said. It said the claim is not based on uh, what IFC did. It's based upon um, what, what happened in India. But the, you know, there's a couple of problems with that. First of all, the Supreme Court said that if you wanna know what a claim is based upon, you look at the elements of the claim. Uh, and you know, this is an ordinary tort claim. The, um, ordinary tort claims you, under all sorts of different theories, you can get liability over the person who is not the most direct cause of the harm. But the claim is in, in those circumstances like aiding and abetting or negligence with respect to the conduct of another or conspiracy, the claim is based upon the conduct of the defendant, right? You're suing them for their own conduct. So for example, if we had come in and said, well, IFC is liable because um, Coastal Gujarat, the company in India did something wrong, IFC would say, no, you have got to show we did something wrong. And that's exactly our point. That's what the claim is based upon. It's based upon what, what IFC did. And what IFC did is commercial activity here in the United States. Um, and, and just to show, you know, sort of, the results that would be if you follow the the, the DC circuits uh, approach, you know, if this power plant had been built in the United States and all other facts were the same, IFC would still be immune because the argument would be it's not based on IFC's conduct; it's based upon Coastal Gujarat's pro, uh, conduct, right? And that would mean that even though Coastal Gujarat built this plant in my, under my hypothetical in the United States and IFC operated in the United States and it's all commercial activity in the United States, they'd still be immune because the argument would be that it's based upon somebody else's conduct. And we think that just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, as I said, every court to look at this has always applied the based upon language based uh, as, as looking to the conduct of the sovereign defendant, not to somebody else's conduct. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what the Supreme Court does with it. Yeah. So we've got uh, about 10 minutes and I, I have two questions and then uh, we have a couple questions as well that maybe we can use as a, as, as a point to wrap up. But if anyone in the audience does have questions, please go ahead and submit them and we will present them to the panel over the course of the next 10 minutes. So first question uh, is from Robert Fitzpatrick. And it's uh, what prevents an employment discrimination case in DC against one of the entities on behalf of an employee of the organization? What arguments should employees, should the employee's lawyer be advancing to establish liability? Um, Rick, I don't know if you want to take that and Elliot, do you, if you want, if you'd like to maybe uh, respond. Well, there's some, so under the two ways to get to it, either, to get to, uh, past immunity arguments, statutory and waiver, you know, our argument, I, I think the clearest cut argument would be that uh, they've waived immunity by the text of their own 
waiver provision. Now, under current DC circuit law, uh, that argument is foreclosed, but um, you know, I, I think it's clearly right. The DC circuit thought it was right until it changed its mind. Uh, it's an issue that clearly should be uh, revisited by the court on bank. Um, whether it's commercial activity or not, there's a, a uh, there's in, there's there's um, some case law, uh, as I remember it, and I may be getting this wrong, that it depends on the nature of the employee, whether they're a civil servant or not, whether the activity is commercial. Um, that's not something I'm super focused on, and I'll probably get it wrong if I try to expand on it. So should probably leave it at that. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Elliot, would you like to address the point? Um, so I'm not an employment lawyer, and if I was, I, I, I would be on the side that would not be offering people suggestions on how to craft their complaints <laughs> against the defendant. But I will say that there is a line of cases that stands for the proposition that internal administration, which includes relations with employees of international organizations, is not commercial activity subject to the FSIA. Um, and so, for example, you know, employees, uh, and the same thing with foreign sovereigns, for example, employees at consulates don't get the protections of U.S. employment law. They're, you know, they, they're subject to the laws of, of uh, the countries from which they come and, and who have established those consulates. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elliot. So uh, another question from Gloria Leal. Uh, and Elliot, I want to maybe start with you on this one. And, and Rick, if you want to uh, chime in after. Uh, it sort of ties in with some of the table setting you did early on. And the question is, is sovereign immunity impacted by host country or trade agreements such as the new NAFTA? Without maybe not, uh, we, maybe not particular to NAFTA, but if you have anything you could say about the new NAFTA USMCA, feel free, but more broadly, if you can address the topic. Well, I, 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 I haven't studied the new NAFTA or the, the, the the immunity implications of it, the, the clearly the modern trend in international trade law is to establish arbitration as a method of dispute resolution, including dispute resolution between private citizens and foreign sovereigns. And so uh, the World Bank Group uh, includes ICSID, which is the international Harut, Center for the that, Settlement of Investment it, Disputes. Uh, the, 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 the alphabet <laughs> soup on that one eluded me, um, which, which exists to resolve investor state disputes um, uh, like the ones that could arise under NAFTA or, or any other trade agreement. And, and so largely those are taken out of the immunity framework because they're handled by arbitration and there are separate international conventions that govern the enforcement of arbitral awards, including in the investor state context. Mm -hmm. uh, Rick, do you want to chime in on this topic, uh, whether sovereign immunity is impacted by host country or trade agreements, such as, for example, USMCA or others? Yeah, I, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not a trade lawyer, so I really don't okay. know uh, of any, you know, effects for, uh, you no. know, as far as we're concerned, it's, it's governed by, uh, by statute and by the waiver provision of, uh, of the IFC or another organization's own charter. Got it. So uh, just in the last, you know, six or seven minutes that we have, I'd maybe want to give each of you, uh, you know, three or four minutes uh, to talk a little bit about where we go from here. Um, the case is obviously ongoing. Uh, there may be other cases, Rick, that you're aware of um, that, or that you're litigating that, that we should keep an eye on. So if you want to maybe chime in first, Rick, where you see this going, how you see it developing, and, you know, other cases that, you know, our audience here should keep an eye on if they're interested in this area. Uh, sure. So for us, we're litigating another case uh, against the IFC where it funded a palm plantation uh, in Honduras. It, it gave money uh, to uh, basically, you know, uh, the, the owner of this company was basically a thug and who was stealing land from local people. Uh, they would have known that. Uh, through a Google search. And when they took this money to expand their palm plantation, they seized uh, lots of uh, campesinos land and murdered m many, many dozens of people in the area. This is one of the most extreme, uh, you know, perhaps the most extreme example of uh, IFC misconduct or, uh, or, or ineptitude out there. That case is being litigated um, 
in uh, the District of Delaware, so it, uh, it would go uh, to the Third Circuit, uh, and which uh, I would suggest might end up with a different ruling than the DC Circuit with respect to the IFC itself on both its waiver provision and, um, and what the FSIA means. It was actually a circuit split with the Third Circuit that, that we assume is what piqued the Supreme Court's interest in JAM. Uh, in the, they, they came out the other way on the IOIA and whether that provides absolute immunity. Um, just briefly, other cases to watch. I mentioned the Exxon case also before the DC circuit, you know, we'll see what they have to say about whether Exxon, uh, whether they, you know, the extent to which they apply the same rule of only the most direct harm uh, can be, uh, the, the government entity that causes the most direct harm can be sued. We'll see if they apply the same uh, rule there or if, or if it, it comes out a little bit differently. Uh, and there's another case also in the DC circuit where uh, an international organization is being sued by uh, a bunch, by a, a, a number of doctors who were essentially trafficked uh, by the government, government, government of Cuba to provide uh, medical services abroad. Another case has got the same uh, issue of whether it has to be the most direct cause of the harm. Um, and so, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to see what the DC Circuit has to say about those two cases. Fantastic, thank you, Rick. Elliot, if uh, we've got about three or four minutes. Yeah, so the case I'm following is that last one that Rick mentioned. It's Rodriguez versus the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO. PAHO is a, an affiliate of the, the World Health Organization, and it's a class action uh, on behalf of Cuban doctors who were trafficked by the communist regime in Cuba, as Rick mentioned. The, the named plaintiff in that particular case was trafficked by the Cuban regime to Brazil, where she was essentially forced to work as slave labor. Uh, by the Cuban government. The way the Cuban government does this is they control everything on the island. So they essentially coerce these doctors into leaving the island and going, in this case, to work in Brazil. The Cuban government then charges the Brazilian government, in this case, hundreds of millions of dollars over the span of, uh, of several years during which the program was in place. It was in place by the prior Brazilian administration and, and was dissolved by the current uh, Brazilian presidential administration. Cuban government charged hundreds of millions of dollars, kept about 90% of that money and gives 10% to the doctors when they come back. While they are on mission, in this case in Brazil, they are essentially being watched by uh, members of Cuban intelligence to make sure that they don't say the wrong things or try to defect. They have to surrender their passports so they can't move around. And they are essentially slave, uh, slave laborers uh, with medical degrees working on behalf of the Cuban government. The nexus to the Pan, Ameri uh, Pan American Health Organization, they brought multiple claims. One of them survived a motion to dismiss at the district court level. And that's the one that's on appeal now to the DC circuit. And that claim is under the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which creates a private right of action against a financial intermediary that facilitates a transaction by which a person is trafficked. And so the district court, district of DC in that case, held that it was commercial activity because acting as a financial intermediary, which is what PAHO did, they collected the money from the Cuban government, then they paid the money to the Brazilian government, um, excuse me, I got that backwards, collected the money from Brazil, paid it to Cuba, and then kept a 5% fee um, for, for their trouble. The district court said that is commercial activity. And they said the claim is based upon it because it's a statutory claim under a provision in, in US law that creates a direct private right of action against a financial intermediary for facilitating a transaction in which a person is trafficked. So it, it unlike the situation in, um, in JAM versus IFC, which is a common law negligence claim, here you have a statute that makes the commercial activity that PAHO engaged in the basis of the claim. So that was heard on oral argument by the DC circuit on November 3rd, you know, anyone's guess how long it takes them to issue an opinion, but there's certainly, as the district judge in that case um, did, there's certainly a basis to distinguish it from JAM versus IFC. And, and we'll see whether or not the DC circuit affirms the ruling of the, the district court that the Pan American Health Organization is potentially on the hook for uh, facilitating human trafficking. Wonderful, thank you, Elliot. There's plenty, I think, for those who are interested in this topic to look out for, including some of your cases, Rick, as well as Elliot, the Paho case that you mentioned.
Uh, with that, uh, I want to take a moment again to thank Elliot Pedrosa and Rick Hertz, uh, who uh, really have been fantastic panelists today in this really very interesting discussion. I uh, look forward to continuing to monitor this issue. I also want to take a moment to thank, of course, you guys, the Federalist Society, as well as the International and National Security Law Practice Group, and of course, all of those of you who have attended today and who may be watching this at some point in the future. Thank you again. Guy. Thank you. On behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank our experts for the benefit of their valuable time and expertise today. And I want to thank our audience for joining and participating. We also welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. As always, keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about upcoming teleforum calls and virtual events. Thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned.